the children were having a blessed time in the Holy Spirit. Others went to sleep when they tried to pray. Those under the anointing could often see demons by those who were drowsy and could not pray through. They saw demons coming in through the open window or the door. Sometimes they saw demons lazily reclining under the table or upon a couch that was in the room. Under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the children, with closed eyes, in the name of Jesus, would rout the demons out of their places and follow them until they went out of the door or window. They frequently followed these demons out of the room, opened a front or back door to the compound, and chased the demons off the premises. When demons appeared on the scene, they were often seen by several persons at the same time. Some of the children had seen demons before. We found that in spite of all our teaching about the Lord, they were still so afraid of demons they dare not go to their rooms alone at night, and they covered their heads when they slept. Through these revelations, however, the children found that the largest and fiercest demons were unavailing against the smallest child covered by Jesus' blood, so that, for the first time, we had a happy lot of Chinese children who had lost their fear of demons, were not afraid in the dark, and were not afraid to sleep with uncovered heads. You may wonder what the demons were like. The demons seen are best described as resembling the demon idols in Chinese temples. According to the Bible and according to the Chinese, much idolatry is demon worship. Making idols of the demon type is an attempt to reproduce the likeness of demons that have been seen. The children saw demons as high as a door, with pointed chins and warty heads. There were others of different appearance, too, some half this size. There were smaller ones two or three feet high, and little ones a few inches high, following the larger demons about. The large, big-eyed, fierce-looking demons are the ones to be feared as having power to bind and take captives to hell. The Principalities and Powers of the Air The host of the powers of the air and their works of darkness, in cooperation with demons on earth, were seen by various Adullam witnesses, whose testimony is as follows. The government of the hosts of evil is in mid-heaven. Here are thrones from which the devil's angels exercise their satanic government over the earth. These rulers of darkness vary. Some are larger in stature than others. There is variation in dress, crowns, facial expression, disposition, and authority. In all respects they are as devilish in appearance and acts as the hosts of Satan are expected to be. These rulers of evil are in constant contention among themselves, each resenting the authority of those higher in power, each jealous of the other and all covetous of the seats of highest rank. Those in higher rank hold their positions, not by consent of the lower orders, but solely through their own superior fierceness and power. Cliques and individuals are in constant conflict and quarrels. All have crowns that represent various orders and ranks. All desire to sit on the thrones above and supervise the work of evil on earth, rather than descend on delegated duties to further the demonical powers below. Those of highest rank sit on thrones in the mid-heavens, ruling over innumerable hosts of evil spirits, from whose number delegations are constantly dispatched to earth to entice its inhabitants, to withstand the forces of righteousness, to strengthen weak places in the demonical forces of earth, and to bind and to drag the souls of evil men to hell when they die. Although these wicked angels fly in high heaven to the very gates of the new Jerusalem, and although they descend to earth and fly in its air, the center where they congregate in countless numbers is in the region of the thrones of authority in the mid-heavens. Here evil hosts of wicked spirits of all sizes fly hither and thither or move about more deliberately. A certain halo surrounds the wicked angels of higher rank. All are similar in some respects. All have wings. All have crowns. All belong in the heavens. The delegated messengers go to earth only temporarily. Their evil errand finished, they again return to the heavens. The hosts of evil spirits on earth are very different from the devil's angels. Those on earth do not have wings. They can walk and run rapidly, and they move freely but apparently do not leave the earth. They vary in size from a few inches to ten feet in height, wear gaudy colored clothes of many stripes, and have fancy caps of various shapes and colors. Some, on the other hand, wear rags or filthy garments. Some of these demons on earth have very little power, and are of a rather harmless order. Others, however, are large in stature, fierce in appearance, and have great power. These on earth withstand the work of righteous men and the work of angels among men. In one of their conflicts with an angel, earthly demons of highest rank, assisted by others of lower rank, 
gathered about the angel trying to strike him with clubs, swords, and other weapons. Through faith and praising the Lord, the angel so withstood this onslaught that no blow fell upon him, nor could an evil hand touch him. The demons of less power, standing at a little distance and watching the conflict, upon seeing their companions unsuccessful in their attack, besought the powers of evil in the heavens to send a reinforcement of the devil's angels from the air. In response to this entreaty, a detachment of ten angels were sent down. As these approached the earth, the demons below clapped their hands in joyous welcome. When the wicked angels from above reached the scene of conflict, these less powerful demons, receding a distance, stood in respectful quietness in the presence of the satanic delegation from above, who now took up the conflict with the angel. These forces the angel also withstood with praises and faith, until suddenly the glory of God descended and entirely routed all the hosts of evil. The boy who saw a Christian die also saw what takes place when the unconverted die. When one man, who did not know the gospel, died, his soul, after being liberated from the body, wandered about unhindered from place to place on earth, until one of the devil's angels, descending from the sky with chains, bound him and forced him down to hell. The death of a professing Christian who had known the Lord, but had not truly repented, was still more terrible. When this man was dying, demons by his deathbed waited in fiendish delight for the liberation of the soul of this hypocritical, one-time professing Christian. The demons began to bind him before he was entirely out of the body, and completed the binding of their captive the minute he drew his last ungodly breath. The hypocrite did not enjoy one moment of freedom to wander about the earth. An object of ridicule to his demon captors, in terror he was at once dragged and pushed into hell. One such ungodly man was the special sort of demons who, having bound him in chains, dragged him along on the earth, again and again jerking him up on his feet, only again to drag him down and haul him along like a dead dog. After furnishing amusement for his captor, the man was dragged down the dark road to the infernal regions. There was a boy dragged from Adullam to hell. Because he had been so bad, he was discharged as an errand boy by an officer in the army. After seeing him begging on the street for several days, we took him into the Adullam rescue home. He promised to reform, made an outward showing of decency, heard the gospel for a considerable time, and professed repentance. Different articles disappeared from the home, but the thief was not found until this boy was caught on his way to sell the stolen plunder. We then put him out of the home. After several months of beggar life, during which time this boy repeatedly promised to reform, if only we would allow him to return, we gave him another chance. The Lord also gave him another chance, for there were manifestations of the Holy Spirit and supernatural revelations sufficient to make the way of life clear to the most simple. This boy himself had anointings of the Holy Spirit when the Lord dealt directly with him about his sins and showed him the better way. In spite of all this, the boy ran away and joined a street gang of beggar thieves. A few months later, he fell and broke his arm. Infection set in, and he was about to die when he was picked up by a hospital worker. In the hospital, he was so hopelessly disobedient that he was thrown out and was soon in a dying condition on the street. Coming to us with promises of repentance, we pitied him and took him in once more. Day by day, he neared the end of the way. The night before he died, I was awakened by unearthly shrieks that sounded like uncanny howls of some wild animal or of some fiend. The next day when the boy died, I was away from home. As he lay in death throes, delighted, awful, hellish demons gathered about him. When his soul was leaving his body, the boy, seeing his captors, wept, yelled, shrieked, and cried at the top of his voice in wildest terror. Mr. Baker, help! 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 Oh, Mr. Baker, come quickly! Mr. Baker! Mr. Baker! Mr. Baker! Help! They are all about me with chains! They have come for me! Help! Help! Mr. Baker! Help! They are binding me with chains! Oh, help! Visions of Hell Over and over again, children had visions of hell and the lake of fire. The first time anyone was under the anointing of the Spirit, he usually had a vision of hell. He was bound in chains by demons and taken through a region of darkness. Some children could hear demons all about them in this region. If taken far, they could see a dim light in the distance, which proved to be reflections from the lake of fire. Some children were forced so near they could see the lake of fire ahead. All the time they were pleading the blood of Christ, asserting that they would not obey and would not be so 